So we're going to actually start by reading this morning. So go ahead and find Acts chapter 15. We're going to read verse 1 through 35. Then we'll, we'll discuss it. So Acts chapter 15, verse 1 says, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No. We believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in agreement with this, as it is written. After this, I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent. Its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name says the Lord who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to obtain, to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from the blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times, and is read in synagogues on every Sabbath. Then the apostles and elders with the whole church decided to choose some of their own men and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They chose Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, men who were leaders among the believers. With them they sent the following letter. The apostles and elders, your brothers, to the Gentile believers in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia. Greetings. We have heard that some went out from us without our authorization and disturbed you, troubling your minds with what they said. So we all agreed to choose some men and send you, send them to you with our dear friends Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we are sending Judas and Silas to confirm by word of mouth that what we are writing. It seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond the following requirements. You, you are to abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual impurity. You will do well to avoid these things. Farewell. So the men were sent off and went down to Antioch, where they gathered the church together and delivered the letter. The people read it and were glad for its encouraging message. Judas and Silas, who themselves were prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After spending some time there, they were sent off by the believers with the blessing of peace to return to those who had sent them. But 
Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, where they and many others taught and preached the word of God. So we have a narrative. We have a continuation of the story. We're still looking at how the church was built, how things were changing, how the Holy Spirit was interacting with them, all these kinds of things. We're going to be learning that all through the book of Acts. But this narrative almost sounds like something we could read right past. Almost like, why is it here? And, and when we see that, that's the very question you need to ask yourself. Why is it here? What is it telling us that we would not know if it wasn't present? And we also have to think in terms of what would they have read when they read it. They had a lot of cultural and historical insights that we have to go find in order for some of this to make sense. So we're going to back off of chapter 15 for a minute. I'm going to give you some context by way of review of things we've already learned in Acts. Then we're going to bring it back to chapter 15. So in your notes, under the section titled Review, let's look at those first three passages. I've quoted for you the part I want you to see. Acts 10.2, it says, He, which is Cornelius, and all his family were devout and God-fearing. Now Cornelius was a Roman, but he met in the synagogue, he prayed, he participated in ministry, and he was called a God-fearing Gentile. Just make note of that real quick. Acts 13, 26, it says, fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles. So we have two groups included who are separate but equal in some ways. The, the children of Abraham, that's the Jews, and God-fearing Gentiles. We see that term again there. Acts 13, 15, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women. So we have this term God-fearing. We, we have to define we have before, let's do it again. So in your notes, God-fearers, and that's what they called them. I think it probably rolled off the tongue a little bit better in Hebrew than it does in English. But they're called God-fearers. So God-fearers were non-Jews who had embraced a belief in the Jewish God, but were unable and or unwilling to become fully converted to Judaism. To convert to Judaism, Judaism was a long heavily involved task. It involved every male being circumcised. It involved walking away from your previous culture, maybe even your previous livelihood. It involved special commitments and ceremonies to become a Jew. It was probably a several month process. And it was difficult. So a lot of people didn't fully convert to Judaism, but they still worshiped the God of Judaism because they recognized he was the true God. On the other side of the coin, the Jewish people did not really welcome converts. They didn't welcome people to become Jews. They would allow you to, but they made you jump through hoops. They, they made it a little bit difficult, so no one did it that wasn't fully committed to it. So the Jews would never say, hey, you should convert. You should become a Jew so you can truly worship God. And the Greeks would often have reasons why they might not want to, like Cornelius. He probably would have lost his post as a Roman soldier. He would have lost his income. A lot of things worked against him. So sometimes it was a job, the cost was too high, lack of invitation. But there were Gentiles who recognized the God of Judaism or, or the God of the Jews as the true God. And they worshipped him, but they weren't Jews. Those are God-fearers. Okay, let's continue down the page. Acts 8, Philip preached in Samaria. This is important because the Samaritans were half Jewish and half Gentile. And they, they lived in a certain area, and, and they were treated poorly, to be honest. Nobody really wanted them. They were all by themselves. They had their place to live. They, they created their own centers of worship because they weren't welcome in, in Jerusalem. So they had Jewish roots, and they had Gentile blood, and they were considered half-breeds, if you will. That's one of the titles they were given. And so the Jewish people, for, for a very long time, had wanted nothing to do with the Samaritans. But remember, Jesus went to see the Samaritans. And Jesus walked in and he shared who he was, what he was all about, and he reached out to the Samaritans. And that was shocking when he did that. And then Philip, after Stephen was martyred, he left town for his own safety. He wound up in Samaria. He shared the gospel there, and a lot of people were saved. So the, the gospel went out to the Samaritans. That's what I want you to note there. Philip also, in the same chapter, evangelized the Ethiopian eunuch. 
And remember, the Ethiopian eunuch was in Jerusalem so he could worship at the temple. And that would make him a God-fearer. So, so far we have God-fearing Gentiles and we have Samaritans. In Acts 9.20, this is at when, when Saul was converted. It says, after, excuse me, at once, he, Saul, began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, a synagogue was a, a local place where Jewish people gathered to do church-like things. It, it wasn't, no sacrifices were made, none of the ceremonies were done. It was a place where they gathered on a weekly basis to read scripture, pray together, receive instruction and encouragement, a lot of the same things we do. They still had to go to Jerusalem to offer their sacrifices, pay their, their dues and all this kind of stuff. But a synagogue was open to anybody that wanted to hear about this God or wanted to pray to this God, that kind of thing. And so Paul, when he was still Saul, the very first thing he did after his conversion was went and preached in the synagogues. Acts 11, 19, and 20 says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecutions that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled, spreading the word only among Jews. Some of them, however, began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. So the, the, the main evangelism by the apostles, by, by anyone who was out there, was to the Jews. They went and spoke to Jews who would recognize the word Messiah, understood the concept of a Savior, knew who Jesus was, probably, and they went to the Jews, and, and a few went to the Greeks. It was, it was the exception to the rule. It, it, that's why it says only among Jews, and, and some went to the Greeks. In Acts 13.5 when they, Barnabas and Saul, arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. Now this was during their missionary journey. They were actually going out into the, into the world around Israel to proclaim the news to Gentiles, but they still did it in the Jewish synagogue because they were seeking Gentiles who were seeking God. Acts 13, 14, on the Sabbath, they entered the synagogue and sat down. Acts 14, 1, at Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Greeks believed. So these Greeks were God-fearers. So in the Jewish synagogues, there were a lot of visitors, if you will. There were people there who were not Jews, but they were recognizing that this God is the real thing, and they were there. Now we get to chapter 15, and I want you to know that the church is about 25 to 30 years old. So they have been spreading the gospel, they have been converting Jews, they have been doing all the things we've been reading about, even venturing out into, into some Gentile areas for about 30 years. But their mentality was, we're going to go talk to the Jews and people who are hanging out with Jews. We're going to talk to the Jews, the Samaritans sometimes because they're half Jews, and then the God-fearers because they've, they've come to where we are. So in your notes there, only Jews and God-fearers were actively evangelized outside of Antioch. Antioch was the exception, and a few other remote places. So if, if you were hearing the gospel, it probably meant you were attending a synagogue. You were, you were hanging out with the Jewish people trying to figure out who the Jewish God was. That's how you heard the gospel. That, that, was, that was the practice 30 years in. This was the main thing. However, over the past five years or so, as, as, as the gospel goes out, as, as people are being trained, now remember, not, not a single sentence of the New Testament had been written yet. So they weren't reading the gospels. The, the letters to the churches in Corinth and Ephesians and, and all these letters weren't written yet. Revelation wasn't there. They were learning as they go, learning from the apostles, learning how to practice their faith. They had not yet transitioned to the point where they were willing to accept just common, everyday Gentiles. But they were still getting saved. So the number of Gentiles getting saved who weren't God-fearers was increasing. So there were people that were just hearing the gospel and responding to it and becoming believers. And, and so that, that stirred up a little bit of controversy because let's, let's go back to the Jewish people. The Jewish people had a lot of pride in the fact that they were Jews, that they had the law, 
that the Messiah was one of them, that they were God's chosen people. And even those who became believers still had that pride. And so let's look at number one there under chapter 15, 1 through 5. It says, there were Jewish Christians that were having deep struggles letting go of their Jewish traditions and pride. I want to point out these are Christians. It says, then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees. Now, remember the Pharisees. Pharisees are always the bad guys. They always challenged Jesus. They, they stirred up the crowd. They tried to kill him. They were always the enemy. But even among the Pharisees, many of them got saved after Jesus' death and resurrection. So there were many Pharisees who got saved. And they became believers. They recognized the Messiah. And, but, but as believers, they still had their traditions. They still had the law. They still had things they had grown up knowing were a part of God, and they were having a hard time leaving that behind. What used to be the law was now a tradition. What used to be required was no longer required. And their response was harsh. And, and it's a little bit understandable. I gave you some reasons why they were a bit harsh. And, and what did they say? They say you have to be circumcised, and you have to follow the, the law of Moses. And that's, that's quite difficult on occasion. So, so A, in your notes, why did they feel this way? Well, Jesus was a Messiah both to and from the Jewish nation. He, they could literally say, he's our Messiah. He was promised to us. We are God's chosen people. What makes you think you can, you can become a believer in Jesus without embracing Judaism first? We are the doorway. We're the gate. We're the gatekeepers. We're the doormen. You, you have to go in the proper order. You can't just skip over everything that, that we are as Jews just to become a, a Christian. And, and so they, they kind of felt that way. B, they felt like they had done all the work. They, they were 400 years in Egypt. They were 70 years in exile. They had suffered through the evil kings, and they had thrived under the good kings. They had been subject to the Philistines and others along the way. They had survived the 400 years of silence where there was no prophet. And now they're here. And the attitude was, why did these people get in for free? What have they done? We've made all the investments. We've made all the sacrifices. It's like they're cutting in line. It's like they didn't, they didn't do anything we did. How come they get in so free? And it was, it was a little too free in their mind. And, and indeed, their very identity, they were, they were circumcised they were clean. They, they, didn't, they didn't interact with the unclean. Their very identity was now severely degraded. It was, it was being removed from them. This was no longer the, the way to be, and they had a hard time dealing with that. So these are Jewish Christians who were having a hard time letting go of the old way of doing things, even though they recognized the Messiah. So number two, these same Jewish Christians struggled with long-held faith-based prejudices against Samaritans and Gentiles. They grew up thinking the most religious thing to do was to hate the Gentiles. The most religious thing to do was to hate the Samaritans, to hate the compromisers, to hate those who didn't follow God. And now they're being told to love them. Now they're being told to share Christ with them. Now they're being told that they're welcome in the kingdom. And, and they're having a hard time accepting this. So number three, in response to this new trend of Gentiles becoming Christians, they produced the claim that for them to be Christians, they had to first become Jews. They had to first become Jews. It's like, you've you got to go the way we went. You've got to follow the same path. We're, we're Jews. We're the chosen people. We gotta, you got to follow us. Now, we see similar thinking even today. I hope not as much as it was in the past, but I'm sure it's out there still. Uh, here's an example. We might, we might tell someone, well, you need to stop sinning before you come to church. You, you need to clean yourself up before you come to the church. And that's exactly the opposite of how it works. We're supposed to come to Christ and then let him clean us up. We're not supposed to stop sinning and then get saved from our sin. We're supposed to get saved from our sin and then work the rest of our life to stop sinning. Back in the day when I, was, when I was a kid, it was cut your hair and put on a tie. You look presentable, right? I had long hair and I never wore a tie, so I was that guy. But that's what I heard. Cut your hair, 
put on a tie. Ladies, put on a dress. Be presentable. Traditions, getting in the way of things. We, we have to make sure we're not applying traditions as well. Okay? So the situation is we have a, a bunch of Christians who are Gentiles who just got saved. And we have a bunch of Jewish people who are Christians who have this long heritage. And they're kind of arguing about where the truth lies. We think you need to be more like the Jews, and we don't see any reason to do that at all. We have the new teaching that Peter's teaching, and Barnabas is teaching, and Paul's teaching, and he's not saying we have to become Jews. And they're going, hey, we've been around a lot longer than they have. We know a lot more Bible than they do. We're Pharisees. All right, that still means something. you got to become a Jew. And so they have this big question, and, and they get together. They go back to Jerusalem. They all get together. Peter's there. The apostles are there. Um, Barnabas and Saul are there. James is there, the leader of the church. And, and they, they come up with an answer. And I love the answer. It's in Acts 15, 8 through 19. I'm just going to read a couple of passages. Verse 8. This is Peter talking. And he says, God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit. So this is a great answer. He's like, you know, we, we can cut through all this stuff. It doesn't matter what tradition or what, does it, all this stuff, you know what it all comes down to? God already accepted them. God already brought them in. God already gave them the Holy Spirit. So obviously they don't need the other because they already got the Holy Spirit. They have the same Holy Spirit we have. They're saved just like we're saved. So if they're saved, they have the Holy Spirit. There's the answer to the question. And you know what? It's not our decision. God already made the decision. He already made it for us. In verse 16... Through 18, James pipes up, and he says, you know, you, you heard Peter, and, and that actually goes perfectly along with the Old Testament scripture, and he says, it says, um, the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles. So James says, hey, it was the Gentiles all along. They were always supposed to come. So this is exactly what was supposed to happen. It's, in a, it's a, according to God's plan from the very beginning. And then verse 19, the conclusion is, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult. Why are we making it hard? Why are we making it hard? So that's the answer, but they still have two groups of people. They still have Christians who are struggling with, with the, just the ease at which Gentiles are saved and, and the, lack of, the lack of expectation. And you have Brand new Christians who are so excited about being forgiven. And, and there's, there's still some controversy. So in this case, they compromised. And it's a great example that sometimes there is a compromise to be had that doesn't negate anything God has said, but gives us a place to work together. So in Acts 15, 20, we see the compromise. It said, instead of requiring all these other things, instead of making it difficult... We should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. Really interesting list. Um, basically a few dietary things and then this sin issue. And, and here's, here's the compromise. It's number one in your notes there. They basically said, here are some very doable things that will create a separation between you and the other Gentiles. See, they thought back. And they remembered the point of the Jewish nation was to separate them from everyone else. To be visibly different, morally different, different in practice so that others would look at them and say, obviously your God is the true God, we want to be like you. They were different for a reason. And the Christians are supposed to be different for a reason. They're to attract others. Their, their motives should be different. Their attitudes should be different. Their language should be different. Their, their actions and everything they do is different, and people should say, hey, I want to be like you. So in the, the need for separation, they said, hey, let's do this. Here's some things you can handle really easily. Here's a few things you can do in alignment with our traditions that will not put a hardship on you. Okay? You cannot eat meat offered to idols. Don't drink blood, and, and don't eat meat that's been from an animal that's strangled. Not that hard to do, but socially separates you from the rest. Because that was commonplace. It was no big deal. And then he says, and morally, I want, you to, I want you to avoid sexual immorality. Now, honestly, when I read this, I thought, well, that's stupid. How, how more obvious could that be? And then I started thinking about it. And I realized that not only was sexual immorality 
a normal practice of life, it was actually part of the pagan worship. So not only were their other churches, if you will, their other temples, their other gods, okay with sexual immorality, they encouraged it, they promoted it, and, and they made it available. And it was part of their worship. So anyone who had been a part of one of these other religions, other cults, if you will, other worshiping false gods, this would have been so common that they may not have said to themselves, hey, this is wrong. And the apostles said, hey, you know what? Here's one thing morally you need to separate. If you just separate this way, everyone will know you're different. If all of a sudden it's you and your wife only and you're committed to your family and you're not taking part in these parties and these other things going on, if, if, you're, if you're living that life, people are going to notice. And they're going to notice that you're eating differently and they're going to say, why are you doing this? Well, here's the, we're just following a few of the traditions of, of, of the Jewish God that, that, that we were asked to do by the, the leadership. And, and this area of sin, we're just not taking part in that anymore. So they had some social change and some moral change. So they would be different. So they would be identifiable. And that was a great compromise. But I want you to realize we're still in the book of Acts. Acts is a book of transition. It's getting from point A to point B. The church is being developed. Doctrine is being, is being written. It's being understood. The, the principles and the regulations are being established. And this is not the ending place. So in your notes, this is a temporary compromise while better answers are being formed. We get all the way into 1 Corinthians 8... And we have the teaching on meat offered to idols. And Paul, the same one of the same guys, literally says, hey, we've been doing this long enough that we can quit worrying about where the meat came from. We all know it's just meat. We know that idols are nothing but pieces of wood or pieces of metal. I don't care who worshipped them. I don't care what the meat did. It's just, just a thing that means nothing. The meat is still meat. If you can save some money buying that meat, go ahead and buy it, eat it. Who cares? Don't worry about it. The only issue you have is if you're going to cause someone else to stumble. If you have someone else who's not ready to accept that yet, don't offer them that meat. And Paul literally says, hey, this is not an issue anymore. So the temporary thing was, let's stop doing this. The final thing was, this is not an issue. But when it comes to the sexual immorality, 1 Corinthians 6 to 18 says, flee from sexual immorality. It says, flee from it, run from it. Don't, don't be anywhere near it. Don't be thinking about it. Don't be entertained by it. And, and so this temporary thing, one part went to the don't worry about it anymore. The other part went to, hey, this is definitely a sin issue. It always has been. It always will be. So this is a temporary solution, but it's a compromise. Two groups, both heartfelt, both trying to serve God in this in this transformational time period, trying to figure out how they were going to do what they needed to do, they compromised. An example of that might be a new church trying to figure out how they're going to do church. And one group says, hey, I want to do it like we used to do it. Another group says, hey, I want to do it like we used to do it. It's not the same. Well, we want to try it this way. Well, that's a good time to find a compromise. And they did here. It's a good example. I want to offer you some applications for this passage. And I have three. There's two in your notes. I'm going to give you a, another one for free. Um, application number one, we as believers must embrace and celebrate that salvation comes before change and that change comes over time. Th there is no get cleaned up and then come to church, get cleaned up and then come to God. You come to God first, then you, God works on your life. We have to, to get on board with this. We have to believe that anyone who walks through the door of our church, anyone who comes into our life, anyone that God puts on our heart, we need, to, we need to love them, care for them, treat them well. We need to represent God in their lives, especially before they're saved. Because we need to show God, show them who God is and what he has to offer. Salvation comes first. Then, over time, we let God handle the transformation. We may have two people that I could bring up, stand before you. Each of them is, 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 is dealing with the exact same list of sins, A, B, C, and D. And God may take this person and say, we are starting with A. This is what we need to do. A first, then B. We're going to conquer A, then we're going to move to B. Eventually we get to D, but right now we're doing A. 
And we're going to work on this until it's solved, then we're going to move on because this is what you need to work on. Person over here with the exact same list of sin, God may say, we're going to start with C because if you don't take care of C, you're never going to get A. And if you don't take care of C, you're never going to get B. So God says C first here, A first here. And the rest of us could be watching and we go, hey, we have the same list of sins. He's working on A. Why isn't he working on A? Why, why isn't he doing what he's doing? He's going to get to C. He's starting with C. He can't skip two. That's not right. You can't skip A and B. And God's going, actually, my plan is we're going to start with C because I know best. I know the future. I know the process they're going to go through. I know what interactions they're going to have. I know what their influences are. I know what their, their issues are. And I'm going to take them down a path, and I'm going to create in them who I want them to be, and I'm going to take them where I want them to go, but we're going to go my way. And it might be two completely different ways. And we can't sit here and go, well, they're right and they're wrong. Or they're right and they're wrong. Our job is to get on board with what God's doing and help them process through what God has brought to their attention. God may bring something different about. So not only do we realize that salvation comes before a change in behavior, we also have to realize that behavior changes in different paces and in different order in different people. And God is in charge. Me being in charge would be a really bad idea. And I'm sorry, you being in charge is also a bad idea. We've got to let God be in charge. We've got to let God do the process. This must be our belief, and it must be our practice. Number two, we as a body of believers must never let tradition hinder the gospel. We must not let tradition hinder the gospel. They had traditions that were hindering their work. What are our traditions? Well, in my lifetime, here are some traditions that got so much attention that they hindered the gospel. They hindered the work of the church. Worship styles. We're we going to sing from the hymnal or we're we going to sing from the radio? We're going to do praise and worship. We're going to do... Um, classical type things. We can spend so much time arguing about that that we never share the gospel, we never get discipled, we never grow. That's, those are traditions. Um, where are we going to build a church? What's the architecture going to look like? Can we have a church in a storefront because it's cheap and available? Do we need to build a, a building that looks like a church? Can we have a school there? Can we not have a school there? Architecture, these kinds of things. Clothing. Can you wear jeans to church? Do you need to wear a tie? Do you need to wear a suit? Um, various things like that. Translations of the Bible. Well, our church only uses this translation. And get on board or get out. That's not going to work, right? Translations. Leadership styles. These are all traditions that can hinder the gospel. And, and sometimes the Bible does give us a clear approach and clear instructions on how we do something. And when the Bible gives us a clear instruction and a clear approach, that's how we do it. That is not a tradition. That's a command or a principle, and we follow it. But when we have freedom to make choices, we can't let those traditions get in the way of things because time change, people change, and God does things differently in different places. Now, the third application, which is not in your notes which is probably the most important, is this. There is no group of people that God is not reaching out to. There is no group of people God is not reaching out to. He didn't skip the Samaritans. He didn't skip the Romans. He didn't skip the Gentiles. Matter of fact, he said, he said my message is going out into all peoples, all languages, all tribes, and all nations. He didn't skip anybody. We can't skip anybody. Now, if we're honest... There is someone you're thinking of in the back of your head right now where you think you have the exception. Okay? Well, I know anyone can be saved, but this person is so rich, they'll never need God. I know everyone can be saved, but this person is so sinful, not, they'll never hear God's message. And then anything in between. There's always a saying that goes along with the group, right? These people are so rebellious. They're so arrogant. They're so proud. They're so self-centered. They're, they're, they're so this. They're deceived by this cult. They're whatever. There is no group. There is no economic group. There is no social group. There is no caste group. There is no employment group. There's no age group. There is no group that is not reachable with the gospel. And we cannot look at anyone and say to ourselves, well, there goes someone that, that God can't reach. 
Because when we say that, we are putting words in God's mouth that are not true. God can reach into any heart. I love some of the testimonies online where you hear the testimony of someone that fit the category. Oh, they'd never get saved. And then what happened? They get saved. They tell the story. You know what it usually starts with? I had a neighbor that talked to me. I had a grandmother that prayed for me. I had parents who didn't give up on me. I got so far down to the bottom that I, I had nowhere to look but up, and then, then I saw God. There is no group of people. We must embrace the fact that salvation comes first and change comes over time. Okay, We must not let our own traditions, our own bias, our own opinions get in the way of the gospel. And there is no group of people that God is not reaching out to. I don't know what's there for you, which part of that is for you, but something there is for you. Something there is for me, and I'm going to let the Holy Spirit do the rest. Father, thank you for our study today. Thank you for the people I went to to help me discover what this passage was saying. Thank you that I can relay this, and thank you that we've all heard it. I pray, Father, that you would open up our eyes to see into our own hearts the ones that we have walked past, looked over, disregarded because there's no way they'd ever get saved. Help us to pray for them. Help us to interact with them. Help us to be the ambassador that brings the gospel to them. Father, help us to know that, that you take us all down a different path and, and you take us through life in a different order. And, and there's often a reason for it and we need to accept it. We need to let you be God. We need to let you be in charge. And change comes after salvation. So, Father, help us to focus on the gospel and help us to, to be able to tell people how to be saved, how to have their sins forgiven. And, Lord, if there's anyone here today who has felt like they're in a category that can't be saved, that they've always felt like people look down on them or that, that you skip them in the line, I pray that they would understand that salvation is for them, that you died for every single person, that you did not skip anyone or leave anyone out. And that you're ready to forgive their sins. I pray that you would make that clear to their heart and allow them to respond to it. Father, help us to have a good day. Help us to think about what we've learned and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.